Good day, Mark. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Oh, you're very welcome, Guy, and thank you for inviting me. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up and where you went to college and what you studied? I will. Uh, my name is Mark Shepard, and uh, I grew up uh, about 200 miles north of Toronto, a little town called North Bay. Uh, it's a railway town at the intersection of a couple of major highways. A uh, sleepy little place where a lot of people go to school and then leave. <laughs> um, I studied uh, graphic design actually when I went to uh, when I went to community college, and that's my uh, that's my original background. Of course, it's nothing like what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. So, what did you do after school? You were in the military, as I understand it. I was. Uh, I served in the Army Reserve uh, here in Canada for 14 years and an odd number of days, and uh, had the opportunity to do uh, to do some pretty uh, pretty neat stuff uh, while I was in the uh, while I was in the military, and that was something that I carried on through my civilian work over the years. Um, and uh, now I'm living in Whitby, Ontario, which is just east of Toronto. So, mm -hmm. in case what, did you do, what did you do in the military? I've never been to. <laughs> um, I was actually in a combat trade called armored reconnaissance, and for the folks in the U.S., that's probably the closest uh, thing you would see to Cal Scouts. Is the type nice. of role that I was involved in. Mm -hmm. So nothing that had to do with instructional design or anything like that. Not, not as a primary task, but that was actually where I got my start in learning and development. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, when you go to do your leadership course as a young corporal to move yourself through the ranks, about 40% of that course is spent on what the military refers to as methods of instruction. So you are gauged on your ability to conduct uh, theory classes, knowledge classes, practical classes, drill classes, uh, field lessons, and things like that. It's a very robust methodology for training a lot of people from square one uh, and work on their performance and continue to improve their performance. Very cool. So what, what you, where'd you go after that? Uh, after that, I wound up moving uh, into full-time corporate instruction. I worked as a corporate trainer for a number of years. Um, I was working in some IT roles, something I found myself in very much by accident, uh, but worked in, uh, in a corporate training setting for a number of years. And uh, when I later fit right into their right-sizing plans, I knew that uh, I wanted to continue in L&D, but wanted to get back to some of the things I'd done in the military in terms of, you know, lesson planning, course planning, and things like that. And, and that's been the path that I've been on for the past 20 years. So you've recently started uh, your own business and are out on your own? I have. I have. It's, uh, it's a simultaneously terrifying and satisfying adventure. Uh, it, it, it really is. Um, you, if you work in the corporate sector for a long period of time I, I, and, and then go out on your own, I don't think you appreciate the relative safety net that you have of working for an employer and just how much hustle, I guess, uh, is required to actually make a go of it as a successful practitioner on your own. Thank you. Yes, that's so very true. Can you share with us uh, about any of the projects that you worked on that were uh, of particular uh, interest to you and perhaps to our audience? I had an opportunity a number of years ago to work as a civilian learning consultant for the Royal Canadian Air Force. And the place I was working at was the school where anybody who wanted to turn a wrench on a military aircraft in Canada, this was where they first went to school. And uh, I worked in the innovations group at this school. So we had the opportunity to do a lot of different things. And we were transitioning the base level military training, for want of a better phrase, from very much the sage on the stage type environment to a lot more, um, lot more practical work, a lot more innovative 
work in terms of the training aids that were available for people. Um, physical training aids in aviation, of course, are very, very expensive and they've got maintenance overhead and all that kind of stuff. So we were very heavily involved in actually doing virtual training aids that made a huge difference. So we created everything from a virtual um, weapons depot to allow our weapons technicians to not only recognize the munitions and pyrotechnics that they had to that they would have to source, but also the tasks that were involved in ensuring that the bunkers were properly licensed, that they were secured, and all of those kinds of things, through to a, a very interesting project that used a Microsoft Connect system for a marshalling trainer. So people who are guiding aircraft in, you'll see them at airports when an aircraft comes in and the guys are guiding them and saying, please stop. Well, that's very expensive to do with a real aircraft, uh, but when you're set up with a connect box that's capturing your motion and then replicating on a large screen television, you actually have a very different practical experience. And uh, that was a that was a really enjoyable. Uh, those were two really enjoyable projects to be part of. Very cool. Very cool. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your first exposure to HPT, human performance technology, or evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or however you might refer to it? Well, I didn't know what it was called at the time, but uh, I got uh, when I talked about my leadership course uh, in the in the military. That was back in 1988, and uh, again, a very robust methodology for for. Uh, teaching people. You and I know that instructional design and HPT has its roots uh, back into the training ramp-ups that were required, particularly for World War II, and have evolved since then. So that was my first exposure to it. And it was truly driven by evidence because, and at a very micro level, but it's still really important because you're looking at what an individual soldier or a group of soldiers are able to do. Are they performing to a specific standard? Every lesson that we taught had a performance standard that was associated with it. And if the standard wasn't met, well, then you might have to reteach something, you might have to provide additional practice, or you might have to actually take a look at what you as the instructor were doing that might have gotten in the way. So um, that methodology is the cornerstone of what uh, the Canadian military refers to as the Canadian Forces Individual Training and Education System, or CFITES, and that's their training doctrine. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Can you share with us a little bit about who your biggest influences have been in instructional design? Any people or articles or books that you might uh, point others to? Uh, I've been fortunate to have worked with a lot of really talented people over the uh, over the years, and I like to think that I've drawn from a lot of them. But I would say that one of the most profound experiences I had was it was when I went back and I did graduate school at uh, Royal Roads University in Victoria. And one of the books that I came across during my studies, uh, particularly for my graduate project, was a book by Rothwell and Cookson called Beyond Instruction. It's not one that uh, necessarily comes to mind immediately for a lot of people, but I found it invaluable, particularly when you're looking at evaluation and assessment of performance, because it forced you to think outside the four-step box, which shall remain nameless, um, and <laughs> introduces you to other, um, other evaluation frameworks that actually coincide with the instruction. They're not afterthoughts as some frameworks are, but these are ones that you actually had to think about working in. And that's a book that I would recommend to uh, people to, to take a very serious look at. I found it absolutely invaluable. Excellent. Beyond instruction. If you could uh, give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do. Now, I normally set this up by saying, okay, you're at a neighborhood party and there's somebody that's new in the neighborhood and they don't know you and they come up and say, Mark, what do you do? What, would, <laughs> what is your short, concise, brief uh, elevator speech uh, that may lead to let's go to the bar and have another drink? Uh, that is probably the hardest question for any of us in this industry to industry to answer because it's so niche. Um, but what I like to tell people is that I work at the place where human capital and workplace workplace learning intersect, and uh, also driving innovation 
within those learning environments um, so that you actually have meaningful change in performance. Now, that might not get me another drink at the bar, um, but... <laughs> But for those who work, those who work in the industry will know exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that example. Can you share with us as a lifelong learner what your current or next focus is for learning? And also, are you writing or producing? So where are you going with your own learning? Well, there's two, uh, there's two things that come to mind, one of which is uh, learning really the nuances of how to actually run my own business and be a successful a successful um, sole practitioner. It's, uh, it's far more work than most people I think give it, uh, you know, uh, give any thought to. So that's one of the big things that will be, I guess, an umbrella learning task. And every time I'm involved in a bid or a contract proposal or a pitch, there's always something to, there's always something to learn, if for no other reason but just how much time it takes to actually to actually do it. In terms of some practical stuff for learning and things that I want to expand on, um, I have a couple things that come to mind. One of which is practical applications for uh, for XAPI. Uh, Megan Torrance and I have. Uh, uh, from Torrance Learning, have spoken a lot about XAPI, but uh, she and I know that we want to talk more about about learning the practical sides and, and how to make that easier for people to get into because I think there's a lot of mystery about it. Um, I'm also very interested in the value of uh, of experience like Legos play as a means to stimulate thinking on new ideas and creativity. Uh, so that's something that I have planned to get my Lego Series Play certification, offer that as a service for the business, but also use that as a vehicle and metaphor for getting people thinking differently about instructional design and workplace performance. Thank you. Uh, shifting gears slightly here, is there a performance improvement term or phrase? We're, we're talking about our language in the profession mm -hmm. here, and there's uh, many issues with that, but... Uh, is there a phrase or a term that you would like to put your spin on? Perhaps you think it's being misused or misconstrued or you just have a favorite uh, way of defining that? What can you share with us? Well, I think the, one of the biggest things that we, that we use far too interchangeably are the terms assessment and evaluation. And... <clears throat> While in some respects there are some similarities, and you can say, well, yeah, it's just semantics, but when you look at them a lot more closely, and again, I think back to my experiences working both in the military and as a civilian for the military, that the assessment is really about that individual, where their performance is, where their gaps are, what they're doing, and also what that performance tells you as the learning practitioner about uh, what may need to change, what's working well, what can you support, what can you encourage, all of those kinds of things. Um, whereas evaluation to me is a much more holistic um, uh, much more holistic activity where you are evaluating the course, the experiences, um, where assessment actually forms part of the evaluation. In both instances, of course, you're looking for meaningful data that's coming from, uh, from a variety of sources. But I think we need to be very careful about how we define those, those terms and also where they, <clears throat> excuse me, where they fit into the process. Thank you. Well, let's shift gears here again a little bit. I'd like to uh, explore with you some of the people who have influenced you. You know, you mentioned a book, and you said that there were there were people that that uh, uh, who have had impact on your practices. Mm -hmm. um, so you can either do a shout out and or tell a story, a serious story, a funny story about some of the people that uh, you uh, engaged with in this uh, profession. Well, if if I have the opportunity for a shout out, there's uh, there's four people that I do want to acknowledge. Uh, people that have been part of a of an ongoing conversation for probably the best part of six seven years, and that's uh, Brent Schlenker um, and uh, Tom Spiglanen, Shannon Tipton. And, um, and Trisha Ransom. Uh, these uh, people have been absolutely fantastic parts of my career and 
influencers in their own way because they have all been valuable sounding boards for me um, for the last year. We have a, a, a running uh, we used to have a running Skype chat, and now it's a Slack chat with with just us, and we converse and support each other along the way. And so that's been that's been very uh, very helpful for me. And I think um, I honestly don't know what I would do if I didn't have them around. But as I look to uh, professional influences um, and uh, folks that that I've spent time with, the Harold Jarkey uh, is one of the first ones who comes to mind. Uh, not just because Harold's a fellow Canadian, but it seems like the only time that I see Harold is outside the country. Um, he he and I were both he and I were both guest speakers at uh, the EduTech conference in Australia in 2015, and I was Harold and I were both stunned at the number of Canadians that we were meeting for the first time in Brisbane, mm -hmm. and it, and it's just funny funny how that works. Um, Will Palheimer is another person uh, who is a great influence because Will, uh, with his work with um, doing a lot of the um, myth busting in learning development and performance and improvement um, really helps to underscore to me and reminds me of the value of evidence. And there's a lot of times when I may come across something and one of the first voices in the back of my head says, what might Will think about this? Or, you know, how might Will take this apart? And uh, so he's been he's been very good for that. He's been, a, a, I guess, a wonderful reality check. Um, uh, Patty Shank is the other person who's been who's been a, a great influence. I love Patty's writing, and uh, her commitment to research practices, but also that she doesn't just write about learning development. She's a lot of personal development as well, which I think has been has been wonderful. Um, and if you're ever at a conference with Patty, um, you just need to ask her about her shower head. I'll leave it at that. But ask Patty. <laughs> about her shower head. All right, I'll do I'm going to reach out later today and ask her to tell me that story <laughs> she, because it's, it sounds interesting. Thank, she may not thank me for that, but it's uh it's it's quite a it's quite a funny story the first time I uh I, I was introduced to that concept. Thank you, Mark. Uh as uh we begin to wrap up our interview here, what I'm looking for in my last with my last question is any parting words of wisdom or guidance that you might have for our audience, especially people new to the field, whether they're young or middle-aged or older, what advice would you have for them? I think the first piece of advice for anybody who is new is uh, don't be afraid to challenge your, challenge your thinking and challenge yourself. Uh, those are two very different concepts, I suppose, when you look at it. But, um, you know, don't be afraid to learn something new and don't be afraid to to discover that something that you have held dear is not, in fact, the current state of things or not, in fact, what you thought it was. Um, that's been one of the biggest things for me over the years is, is almost unlearning, as Alvin Toffler refers to it. Um, and, but also, don't be afraid to challenge yourself and... Ask yourself three magic words. How might we, when you're looking at accomplishing a particular task, and that means stripping away what you might normally do and say, well, what if we came at this from a completely different angle? Um, and I've, I've even gone to a, a bit of a micro level, particularly with new classroom instructors, new workplace, uh, workplace trainers, corporate trainers. And I've said, all right, if you didn't have the luxury of a PowerPoint. How might you actually make this lesson work? Now, of course, I come from the days of chalkboards when I got started and PowerPoint wasn't even a thing. So I, I, I like pushing people there. And that's just enough of a push for some people that they get that particular, that particular concept. Um, definitely continue learning. Connect with your peers and influencers. Um, that was when I that was when I finally really discovered the value of Twitter. Um, was realizing just how many professionals were out there freely sharing advice. I mean, you're certainly one of them, guy. But there's a number of other people who do much the same thing, and I cannot underscore the value of that for people. Um, and again, ask lots and lots and lots of questions, lots of them. 
Mark Shepard, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights with us today. Uh, uh, what do you guys say in Canada? Cheerio or what do you say? <laughs> We usually say cheers or uh, or uh, go Leafs go um, for the uh, for the for the hockey fans. Although uh, yeah, after their performance in Pittsburgh last night, yeah, not so much. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Cheers. Take care, guy. Thank you. Cheers.